So without further ado, Senator Ted Lou. Thank you very much. We've got a judicial candidate here, and her name is Shannon Knight. Shannon's in the back of the room. Say hello. Shannon is endorsed by the West LA um, uh, Democratic Club. And um, we also have another candidate for judge. Your name is, I'm sorry? Don Weitzman. She has a flyer on her chair. Thank you. Also well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak, and uh, let me first uh, thank all of you. Uh, you all are the backbone of the Democratic Party, and you help elect good Democrats at the local, state, and federal level, and I wouldn't be here without the support of many of you. So thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, so before I talk about the propositions, I thought I'd give you an update on Sacramento. So I've got some good news. Uh, the good news is uh, that uh, we have had eight months of increasing job creation. We created more jobs last year than any other state. We created it at a higher rate than any other state. And Standard & Poor's has upgraded our credit rating from negative to stable to positive. Now I'm going to give you the bad news. Um, the increases have not been high enough or fast enough so that the revenues are still lagging behind. So Jerry Brown is going to announce on Monday that our uh, budget deficit has increased from $9 billion to about $16 billion. And so we're going to have to uh, do more cuts and try to raise more revenue, which is one reason I'm supporting the governor's initiative uh, in November, uh, which will raise revenue to fund education uh, as well as public safety. I'm strongly in opposition to Molly Munger's initiative, uh, which I think uh, could bring down the governor's initiative, but more importantly, it's just not written very well. Uh, even if it were to pass, it'd be really difficult for us to implement. Um, it would continue to blow a hole in our budget the way that it's written. So, um, the governor will announce what is it's called the May Revise uh, this Monday, in two days, and we're all going to take a look at it, and uh, the legislature obviously gets to uh, change uh, what he proposes. Uh, but it will be uh, not good, so I just want to give you a heads up on that. Now, in terms of some of the bills uh, that I'm authoring, so uh, I'm glad that SB 1172 was mentioned. Uh, what the bill does is it's the first bill in the nation to regulate reparative conversion therapy. And uh, what that therapy seeks to do is to take a gay person and make that person straight. Um, and the problem is not just that it's been completely rejected by the entire medical community. Uh, since 1970, uh, it's been taken out of the DSM-4 manual that medical professionals rely on. Uh, nowhere is it listed that sexual orientation is a mental disease, illness, defect that requires any sort of fix or cure. Um, so the American Psychiatric Association has come out and said it is unethical for a therapist uh, to try to convert someone from being gay to straight. Um, unfortunately, this happens, and there are uh, therapists, in fact, the most prominent therapists are headquartered in California that do this. It's called NARTH, uh, the National Association for Research and Therapy on Homosexuality. And what they basically do is they, th they take mostly children uh, whose parents force them to go to this therapy and basically try to convert them. And if it was just the case of this therapy not working, I wouldn't be so animated about it, but the problem is that uh, this therapy can be dangerous. And what the studies show is that it can lead to intense feelings of uh, self-hatred, of shame, of guilt, of depression, and in some cases, suicide. Uh, there have been documented cases of people going through this and then later committing suicide. So what my bill does is it bans uh, conversion therapy for anyone under 18. And then for anyone over 18, uh, you have to sign a consent form that basically says the entire medical community has rejected this, this can be dangerous, and if you really want to do this stupid thing, sign here. <laughs> so that's what my bill does. Uh, very pleased. Uh, it's <coughs> close. Okay. So I'm really pleased that it has uh, passed two Senate policy committees. It's now on the Senate floor. I'm getting a lot of hate mail uh, from lots of folks on it. Uh, so the other day, this person um, tweeted at me and said, because I'm hearing this bill, I'm not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And uh, so I replied back to him and I said, um, you don't get to decide, God. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, 
know, last Thursday, uh, some folks dropped off the Ten Commandments to my office. Uh, you know, I just want to note if you, if you, for, for those of you who haven't, I'll remind you about the Ten Commandments. It is absolutely silent on sexual orientation. Uh, but uh, it is uh, a hard bill to do because of, of how much intense reaction it is generating. But I think it's absolutely the right thing to do because I think um, uh, some very well-meaning parents are causing their kids intense harm that they just don't know is happening. So uh, that's one bill. I've got another bill that's on the Senate floor. Um, it protects renters. There are some landlords now that require renters to pay online only. Um, and so there's some problems with that. Uh, first, there are some folks that just don't have computers. Then there are folks that have computers that don't have internet. And then there are folks that have both of those and just don't want to pay online for privacy reasons. And so uh, what my bill says is if you're going to require this, uh, that they pay online, well, actually, it says you can't do that. Um, and you can only say that it's an option, plus you have to allow other options, such as cash, check, or any other form of payment. And so that'll be a, that's on the center floor as well. And then I've got a bill. I, I have a soft spot for animals. I've always carried animal uh, protection bills. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a bill that's going to make California as humane as Montana was in 1921, when Montana banned the use of packs of dogs in bear and bobcat hunts. And so, uh, in fact, two thirds of the states either don't allow bear hunting or don't allow the use of dogs for bear hunting. So California is in the minority here. And there's three reasons to ban this. Uh, one is it's dangerous for the dogs. Sometimes the bear fights back, in which case dogs can get killed, they can get injured, they can get lost or stranded. It's bad for other wildlife. So when you have these packs of dogs going, you know, running through uh, during the hunt, they just attack everything in sight. So if they see a baby bear cub, it's too bad that baby bear cub dies. If they see um, a jackrabbit, if they see anything else, they go after it and, and they'll maul it. The bear then basically runs and runs and runs, so the bear gets really tired, and the bear climbs up a tree. And so these dogs have these radio collars on them, and the hunter realizes, oh, my dogs are now circling one spot. Hunter then sort of walks over to where the tree is, looks at the bear, and shoots the bear. Uh, so it's been likened uh, to shooting a bear at a zoo. And that sort of goes to my third point, which is why Montana banned it. They banned it because they thought this was just not fair. It violated fair chase principles. Um, and essentially, uh, you're not really doing hunting. You're just walking to where a tree is, and you're shooting the bear. In terms of bobcats, uh, sometimes the dogs just maul the bobcat. So you're not even doing anything, it's just your dogs doing all of it. Uh, now this bill has also passed the Senate Policy Committees and is uh, also on the Senate floor. Um, so those are some bills, and if you are interested, my staff here, uh, Ronka does a great job, she can give you additional information. If you want, if you want to stand up and focus on All right, so now uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, the two propositions here. Uh, one is Proposition 28, and it will alter term limits. So currently, assembly members can serve three terms of two years, and the senators can serve two terms of four years. And if you did both, it would be a total of 14. Now, what Proposition 28 does is it says, we're going to make the maximum number of years total in legislature 12 years. We're using it by two. But then you can serve all of it in one house. And I, I support uh, this proposition. Uh, so, in, especially in terms of the assembly, where every two years you lose a third of the assembly. I mean, think about running any other institution uh, where you take a third of management and you force them out every two years, whether or not they're doing a good job, and for no reason at all. Um, or running a private corporation that way. I mean, it would never be done anywhere else, but it's done in California because of the way our term limits law works. And it leads to all sorts of um, very negative consequences. Uh, one is uh, you have lots of folks who have very little experience. So I'll give you an example. I'll use me. Uh, when I got into the assembly, in my first term, I was made chair of banking. <coughs> totally ridiculous. There's no reason to make <laughs> first term of assembly should be chair of anything, especially chair of, of that kind of uh, issue area. But I was made chair. And by the time I learned about why negative amortization loans are dangerous in the subprime market, uh, I was turned down. And then someone else has to relearn all, this, all these issues. Uh, it also leads to problems where 
if you're a Democrat and you actually want to do stuff in government, it leads you to want to be dramatic immediately. So in the past, let's say you wanted to incentivize uh, wind energy. Well, you could you know, do in, uh, uh, an informational hearing on it, call in witnesses, get testimony. Then you can direct a study, and then uh, your agency goes out and, and does studies. And then maybe in your second year, you review the study. And by year three, you're ready to introduce a bill that's pretty well vetted. No one has time for that now. So now people enter. In the first year, they just think of the most dramatic thing they can do, and they introduce it because they have no time. So it leads to that problem. And I remember I was uh, in my office one day, I was being lobbied uh, to vote against a particular bill. And the bill was modeled on something Europe had done uh, in terms of uh, electronic waste and how do you dispose of electronic waste. And, you know, the people opposing it made a pretty darn good argument. They said, well, you know, Europe just passed this law. Let's just see how it works. You know, if it works well, we won't oppose it. But we think it's going to be disastrous. We think it's going to have all these problems. So let's just wait a year. And so I remember looking at the bill, and I looked at the author, and I thought to myself, this author can't wait a year because she is turning out. So it leads to these sorts of uh, problems. And I think term limits would, would work if what the term limit said was, um, you can never, ever get another job in elected office after you turn out. If that's what it said, it actually, I think, would work. But it doesn't say that. So as a result, with these short term limits, people enter, and then by year two, their first thought is, where do I go after I turn out? And it leads to exactly the opposite um, consequence, I think, the proponents of term limits wanted. So I think this tweak to term limits law is a good thing. It will let someone have more stability, so you could actually be chair of banking uh, for 10 years, and by you know the time you're there, at that point, you, you, you got it. So um, I support that. I think it's, it's a good measure. Uh, Proposition 29, uh, what that will do is basically tax a single cigarette five cents, basically a dollar per pack. And uh, that will then go to uh, a fund that will be administered by a board that will be set up that will distribute the money and uh, score it about $735 million uh, annually. And it will go to essentially research in terms of uh, you know, tobacco-related diseases. So uh, the LA Times wrote a very interesting editorial on this. The, the um, LA Times came out against Prop 29. And the reason they came out against it wasn't because they thought taxes were bad or that taxes on tobacco were bad. But what they said is, you've got a stake here with a massive budget deficit where you're just cutting everything. Um, and then you can take a source of tax revenue and then lock it up for research. And would this be in one of the top 10 priorities? Probably not. It probably wouldn't even be in one of the top 50 priorities, right? So, so the issue is not so much do you want to, at least in my mind, do you want to tax tobacco, uh, which I would vote for. It's the way they've written it, it goes to basically one thing, which is mostly research. Uh, that could be done in California. It doesn't have to be. It could be done you know, in, in North Carolina. So. Um, I'm not quite sure what I think of Prop 29. Um, I'm happy to entertain your thoughts as well. I'm sort of thinking through it. I, I support taxes. I support. I also support taxing tobacco in the sense that it will theoretically reduce use of it. So some folks will theoretically not smoke as much because they've got to pay more. But the question is, do you lock up this revenue source? for one thing for essentially the next 15 years, and then you can't change it. Um, and I've seen prior propositions that locked in revenue for one thing and how hard it is. So uh, if you remember Prop, I think it was 63, the mental health initiative that Daryl Steinberg uh, proposed. Uh, he was known for that. It was one of his greatest accomplishments. And I mean, all of us here support mental health funding. Well, a few years ago, he actually came out and said, Will you please vote for another proposition that unlocks some of this funding? Because we have so much other things in this state that we are cutting and devastating. We need to just take some of those funds and shift it. Voters said no, because once a voter has put something in, really hard to alter. So as a result, about 70% to 75% of our state revenues is just locked in. It makes it very hard to govern. Um, and so, uh, that is why I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do on Prop 29. Um, 
And so with that, I will answer uh, any questions you may have. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Yes? Uh, any chance of getting rid of term limits? <laughs> yeah. I'd like, just like to see them gone so that if we hire somebody, we can um, I, I, you could probably get rid of term limits. Oh, the question is, any chance of getting term limits? Uh, so uh, when, when California has massive surpluses and everyone is really doing really well, at that time, you might be able to. But right now, when things are not going well, uh, most of the voters just hate legislators, which I understand. So it's, it's a difficult political climate right now. Um, hopefully, this slight alteration will will get passed. And keep in mind, the, the way they're trying to pass this is they're saying we're going to reduce the number of years the legislature can be in office. So um, I think it's hard during difficult times to get rid of term limits. Yes? Uh, does that proposed rule allow you to spend some time in each house as long as the total is not more than 12 years? Yes. Uh, it would be odd for you to do that, but you, you could. You could go back and forth if you wanted to. Yeah. Yes? Um, recently, the Los Angeles Times has taken issue with a part of your legislation proposed for the um, straightening out gay people. Right. What is your response to that? Ah, so uh, the LA Times <laughs> agreed with me and, and, and the sponsor, Equality California, that this therapy was baseless, uh, that there was no reason for it, no need for it. Their view was they thought the market would take care of this because parents would figure out sooner or later that this thing doesn't work. The problem with that is um, the reason the well, first of all, the market has not worked because uh, what the evidence shows is, in fact, more people are now being sent to do this. Um, and in fact, uh, North, the, the main practitioner in California, tried to get accreditation for continuing medical education to be able to teach a class of this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually increasing. But the reason market doesn't work um, is you've got, right, you've got parents whose world was just turned upside down, right? Mm -hmm. And the child that they so love has now been made out to them as an unnatural sinner. And they are desperate. They are desperate to do anything, to try anything. And they will send their kids uh, to these therapists who essentially prey on them because they're so vulnerable by saying, we can change your kid. We can turn your kid from you know, being gay to being straight. And then they just go through the craziest things. They'll, they'll have them play more sports. They'll have them, um, you know, I was watching this, this CNN um, <coughs> special that they did on it. They had this therapy where they would put feminine toys in front of the kid and masculine toys. And if the kid chose a feminine toys, the, mo the mom was told to ignore that kid. Damaging things. And when you hear their witnesses that have went through this, um, they will say uh, how it, the, the one guy actually said, it made me want to kill myself for a decade of my life. Um, so, so the market doesn't work very well when you have very vulnerable, desperate people that are, are, that are trying to get this done. The market also doesn't work very well when people act irrationally. Right, because what all the medical evidence will show is that, um, first of all, uh, homosexuality right is not a mental illness for the same reason that heterosexuality is not a mental illness. Uh -huh. um, but the studies also show that this it just doesn't work, uh, and the only study that showed it might have had some effect for highly motivated individuals who wanted to change that was sort of the study. Uh, well, the doctor that did it, Robert Spitzer, last month actually retracted the study and apologized to the gay and lesbian community. So the evidence is totally overwhelming, except people will ignore it, right, because of a very deep ingrained belief, most of which is religious, that this is wrong. And so the market doesn't work when people don't, don't act rationally. So for those reasons, I just think the LA Times conclusion is wrong, um, and, and that parents often don't know how much damage it is to the kid until it's uh, too late. So. Yes? Good morning. We have three district attorney candidates here today, all of whom are Democrats, and none of whom you have endorsed. In fact, you have endorsed Carmen Trutanich for DA, even though he is a lifetime Republican who is now running as a decline to state, and the Democratic Party has not endorsed them. In fact, has endorsed Annette Myers for DA with over 90% vote. 
My question to you is, do you think it's okay to break away from the Democratic Party's endorsement and endorse a candidate that the party has not endorsed, especially someone who is not a Democrat? So, you know, I, um, let me commend all three DA candidates uh, for their public service, uh, for the sacrifice they've shown in running for elected office. And I wasn't actually going to tell people here uh, that I endorsed Carmen Trutanich. But now that you have now forced me to do that, I will say why I endorsed Carmen Trutanich, why the Labor Federation has endorsed Carmen Trutanich, and um, you know why I support him. So, well, I mean, if, now, if, if you want to retract that question, because no, I don't have to sit here and pump up Carmen is, Trutanich. If I could just repeat the specific no, question. No, 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 no. I know your question. Okay, complete answer. Thank yeah. you. Uh, can a Democrat endorse Carmen Trutanich even though the Democratic Party has not? And the answer is yes. That's my belief. I will endorse the person I believe uh, uh, is the best candidate for that job. But if you want to retract your question, I know I have to sit here and pump up Carmen Trutanich. That was not why I was called here. I was called here to talk about propositions about Sacramento and to commend the candidates who are running. Yes? In, in your uh, legislation that you talked about, about this reversing people, is there anything in there that would correct some of the bullying that goes on in schools? Or is there anything else in the legislature to, to do something? Because I see this in the news all the time now. Yes, so bullying is a problem in schools. Um, and a few years ago, I, jit, I did authorize one of the first bills in the nation that um, cracked down on cyberbullying. And so what cyberbullying is, is bullying through electronic means. And now that kids have Blackberries and phones and, 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 and so on, um, they can get very horrendous messages and pictures sent to them. So right when we were kids, um, if someone bullied you, they sort of had to do it to you face to face. And maybe there might be a few people standing around. Well, now, right, through Facebook or social media, someone can send a naked picture of you to 500 of your classmates. So the potential is far more extreme. In fact, kids are committing suicide because of cyberbullying. So, um, so in California, we try to crack down on that. In terms of other bullying, it, a lot of it depends on how teachers and administrators react, and they would do a better job at doing that. We could reduce some of that. Yes? Um, I want to clarify what you're saying about some initiatives coming up in November. Like, say, a couple months ago, there was the governor's tax measure and the millionaire's tax, but then they they basically nailed it. We withdrew that, came out with a new one, sort of merged it so that raises the sales tax by a quarter percent rather than a half and starts taxing people at a quarter million rather than a million. But it, uh, so it's still a good sensible measure. But it doesn't hurt to not only mention the governor's measure, but mention, well, I guess, well, anyway. Also, there's the Clean Energy Jobs Initiative, which would end the out-of-state corporate tax loophole. Do you know about the out-of-state corporate tax loophole? I do. Like the Perez bill yep. regarding it? That? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So uh, there is a loophole called a single sales factor. I voted every year to eliminate that. So there was one uh, um, last year was brought up to close it. All the Democrats voted for it. None of the Republicans did, so it failed. Um, so this year... There's two things going on. Actually, there's, there's several things going on. So, and it'll sort of show you the problem, right? One senator, Senator Saunier, has a bill to close this loophole, which will bring in about a billion dollars into California. And, and what the loophole does is it allows certain corporations to choose how they want their taxes scored based on where the headquarters are and how many people they have employed in the state. It, it's sort of a very technical thing, but essentially, it lets some corporations have a lower tax liability. Um, that's all you need to know. So to close this loophole, it'll, it'll uh, bring about a billion dollars. So one senator has a bill to do exactly that, and then he funds veteran services with it. Um, you have uh, Speaker Perez that closes the loophole, and then he funds scholarships for college kids going to UC and CSU. Then on uh, the propositions, you're going to have one that's just about, that may have qualified already, and definitely will qualify. They'll close this loophole and fund um, basically clean technology and other environmental 
things with it. So you have right three ideas here to close the loophole, each of which, when you think about it, again, locks in this revenue for a very, very specific purpose that we then can't change. The clean energy jobs one, yep. for the first five years, half goes to those clean energy jobs, mostly solar panels on school rooftops and more energy efficiency, and the other half to the state budget, and then after five years, all of it would go to the state budget. Correct. So um, it is half locked in, right? Four five um, years. So, so you know, um, again, I, I so I'll vote any time to close that loophole. It, but to me, it's like Prop Twenty Nine. I I have to think through. One, do we want to lock in the revenue for one specific purpose? Because right with a state facing a sixteen billion dollar budget deficit, uh, why love <coughs> higher education is giving scholarships for college students, one of the top 10 priorities facing us. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I'll bet you most people say it isn't, right? I mean, you've got just funding basic education, you've got health care, you've got public safety. Um, you you want to make sure you don't kick people off kidney dialysis machines, we don't kick people out of domestic violence shelters. So, you know, is, is scholarships right now, you know, one of the main things we want to lock this revenue in. So that's just something to think through. Yes? About the cigarette cash? Yep. Is the cancer research people, who is the one that initiated? Because now I'm listening to you about tying up money. Of course I was all for taxing cigarettes, but now I'm thinking, is this to create more jobs for cancer research people? I wonder who initiated No, No, uh, um, no the, the people supporting it are, are good people. I mean, it, it's, you, all the anti-tobacco groups are supporting it and, and folks. Um, it makes, I mean, it's, it's not a bad thing to tax tobacco. It, the only question is, do you want to lock up that funding for research? And it's just something you have to decide. I haven't quite thought yet I, how I'm going to decide. I'd like to know if it's that. cancer research people that initiated it. You know, I, do, I, can't, I don't know. Well, yeah. how can we find out who initiated the, the, the initiative? From the Secretary of State's website. Yeah. In this room knows the, the Secretary of State's website would actually have does, does information. Does in this room know any information about what group initiated it? I don't know. <laughs> yes, Mark. Can you talk a little bit more about the May revise and how, what, what you think we ought to do to balance the budget? Right given the numbers that we're going to have? So, um, so what I, I, let me take a step back and, and maybe explain how I think California succeeds. And I think we're going to succeed by emphasizing our competitor advantages, right? Things that uh, we can do better than other states or other nations. So when you look at the economy, um, about 12 to 15 sectors make up 70-some percent of it. And so we have things like aerospace, um, in my district, um, you know, we build satellites. It's a hard thing to build satellites. You can't just sort of go to Idaho and say, start building satellites and you're launching the space. Um, we've got uh, agriculture. Um, we've got uh, ports. We have entertainment. Uh, we have uh, biotech. We have a whole bunch of different industries that we do pretty good at here in California. And if we could start helping those industries, that's how I think we succeed. So uh, it's called a sector-based strategies. Uh, Michigan did it uh, under uh, Jennifer Granholm, Democratic governor. Uh, Pennsylvania has done it. Um, California, unfortunately, has no state plan. We don't have any uh, agency that does this. We used to have a trade and commerce agency. Unfortunately, that was eliminated. And I'm, I'm just trying to get folks to now start thinking um, about sector strategies. So I'm very excited that I have a bill. It's a Senate Bill 1402. And so every year the California Chamber of Commerce comes out with um, their list of job care bills. So this year they decided to also do something kinder and gentler. They also came out with a list of job creation bills. And so I, um, mine was one of 23 bills on there. And what SB 1402 does is it um, changes, recasts, and reauthorizes the economic workforce and development programs at our community colleges with the goal of creating folks with the skills that uh, employ employers actually need in the 21st century. And I had this very interesting hearing with Raytheon a few years ago where 
they testified that their CEO does not lose sleep at night because of increased taxes or regulation. Uh, he loses sleep because he can't fill the open positions that he has. And so we have to do a much better job with aligning education, higher education, and skills with what uh, our workforce needs. Um, now, specifically on um, the May revise, uh, because we're not the federal government and we, we can't print our own money, uh, either we have revenues um, or we don't. And at a very base level, the budget's pretty easy. Uh, either you get more revenues or you have to make more cuts or you borrow. We pretty much max out the borrowing. So we're at a point where if we don't get more revenues, our only choice is to make cuts. <coughs> Of the $16 billion, uh, what the governor, I believe, will propose to do is to take $9 billion of that and score it as the November initiative passing. We're just going to hope and pray that it passes and that Molly Munger doesn't mess it up. Which then means we've got about seven, six or $7 billion to close in cuts. Um, in January, he had proposed a little over $3 billion in cuts. We're going to have to double that. Um, I don't know what that will be, because the governor will propose it. It will be awful. It will be incredibly awful. Um, so, yeah. Yes? Excuse me. Could, um, we have time only for two more questions. Ah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, one of the big problems facing in California right now are the number of incarcerated prisoners, many of who are doing three strikes 25 to life for nonviolent theft related type felonies because they're drug addicts. Is the legislature taking any look at some way to reduce the number of uh, incarcerated prisoners? Yes, so, so other reason to support the governor's initiative in November is it uh, provides funding for public safety realignment, which uh, really drew down the number of state prisoners we had in state prison. Uh, it uh, makes local folks participate more, and it actually will have far less drug offenders in state prison because they'll actually be at the local county jails who have a lot more flexibility to release them. So um, if you recall, Sheriff Baca has actually done an early release of, of jail inmates uh, who committed nonviolent crimes. Um, so if, again, an issue doesn't pass in November, it will be catastrophic, not just for education and other budget issues, but also for public safety realignment. So realignment was a big deal, and it has at least allowed us to now uh, comply with the federal court's order to reduce state prisoners. I support drug courts. Um, you know, I, I think what uh, drug offenders need are, is treatment, and not to be sitting in a state prison. So I'll take uh, one more question. There's uh, someone else in the audience other than myself, please go ahead. Um, what is the position, or have you uh, looked into Perez's uh, 1585 in terms of redevelopment? Um, and if you haven't looked into that particular bill, what is your view on, in terms of what should be happening at this point with economic development for the city? Uh, so, so, re so let me get what happened with redevelopment. Um, last year, the governor wanted to eliminate redevelopment agencies. And legislators said, no, we don't actually want to do that. Um, we want to eliminate redevelopment agencies, and then we want to resurrect them in a much more efficient way um, and to reduce some of the abuses. And so what the legislature did is we had one bill that eliminated redevelopment agencies. We had a second bill that resurrected them. And basically said, you can continue going forward. We're going to take away the school tax portion of your funding, but you get everything else. So. All of the redevelopment agencies could have continued at basically anywhere between a 60 to 80 percent funding from before. For some unknown reason, the California League of Cities and the redevelopment agencies associations chose to sue on both bills. And then the California Supreme Court did the worst possible thing. And they said, well, you can eliminate redevelopment agencies, but we're not going to let you resurrect them the way that you have. So we are now stuck in a situation where we have nothing, even though that was not the intent of the legislature. Um, unfortunately, the, the League of Cities sort of forced this hand. So you're in a position where you've got a governor that got what he wanted, because that's originally what he wanted. 
So it's unlikely he's going to sign something, if it was put on his desk. But even before getting there, the bigger question is, we got to do something that actually complies with the court and, and le uh, sort of the, the legal reason the court had. Uh, now, having said that, I support local investments at the local level. I was a Torrance City Council member. I uh, supported RDA. That's why I supported the second bill. I still believe in having uh, local cities do infrastructure investments uh, to be able, be able to reduce blight and all sorts of things. So I'm, I'm happy to vote for anything to resurrect redrive agencies. The only question is, uh, is it legal and would the governor actually sign it? So that I don't know. Um, with that, thank you very much for inviting me.